food, then metaphor actually diminishes uh, and we should be striving towards really the eradication of religion because that metaphor is actually a, a, a substitute or something that fills in by our own ignorance. Okay, I've got two people here. I've seen you, but what I'm going to do is after I take these two, I'm going to have a one sentence from each panellist. One yes. sentence. And then I'll go back to you, sir. My name is Archie McIntyre, a, a member of the Humanist Society of Scotland. I'm trying to imagine how creationism is taught in school. Presumably a teacher will say to the children, uh, God created all these planets and stars and everything, and he allowed a meteor to come and land in the Gulf of Mexico and destroy all the millions of dinosaurs that he so painstakingly created. Then he allowed all evolution and he allowed the human beings to be created and he sat and watched them destroying millions of each other, killing them, terrible slaughter. And then he'll go on to say, and that was, by the way, that was designed and also it is intelligent. <laughs> now my question is, at what point did the intelligent designer stop using his intelligence? Yes, and there's a gentleman in front of you, and then I'll come back to the panel for one sentence, and then go to you. I'm a, I'm a mathematical physicist by memory, but I'm also uh, a little bit of a philosopher, and a little bit of a biologist, so I have questions along those three axes. The philosophical question is, if we have to accept a creative universe, why suppose that it's God? Why can't it be a devil or an alien or something we don't know about? The uh, biology uh, dimension is back to Dr. Surtees' remark, which you start with a premise and he explains his premise. Uh, you're teaching this to kids in school who are logical, and the thing about science is that you start with a premise and then you deduce a consequence. A direct consequence of what Dr. Surtees said is that vaccination does not work. The mathematical physicist aspect uh, relates to uh, his website where uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Andy McIntosh, who's a thermodynamicist. I'm a thermodynamicist. I work in the nuclear industry. At the technology end of all this, uh, kids coming out of school don't just do science, they do technology. They've got to keep on the modern science going. And Professor McIntosh says, my knowledge of thermodynamics has shown me that all mechanical systems, such as an engine or a fridge or an aeroplane, etc., require not only energy, but ordered machinery in order to work. Thus, simply adding energy to a lump of matter will not turn this machine into a machine that can be used for work. Clausius and other great thermodynamic specialists of the past demonstrated this in the precise expression of the second law of thermodynamics. Working machinery or coded information <coughs> when dealing with digitally controlled machines such as DNA is always required before anything works. That's on Dr. Surti's website and it's aligned with his demonstration that vaccination cannot work. What it means is that rain cannot work. Because the earth is a lump of matter, the sun adds energy to it, it evaporates water from the sea, that blows over my lawn and rains and waters it. That's a very, very effective machine that generates useful work. This is absolutely dramatic. What the creationists are saying is that they want to introduce into science classes issues that are technologically unsustainable. The consequences of what they're saying will undermine the mathematical physics of how our modern society works. And it's very, very serious. Thank you. OK, we've got one sentence each. Whatever you want to pick up on, the most important thing you think you want to say. Okay. Um, I know that's a fair amount. I think I agree heavily with what Julian is saying to a degree where this is about philosophy, it's about worldviews, and if the science classroom was immune from philosophy, just teaching science, I would have nothing to say. We'd all be on the same side. But it is teaching philosophy. It's teaching a, a philosophy where there is no God, where this universe is the result of a kind of godless uh, series of events or uh, an intelligent series of events. And it's only fair to address that 
in that situation to say that there is a case also for a God alongside the case for no God. Christopher. Well, I've only got one sentence. I'm going to choose a sentence actually from a, a more qualified person, which is Michael Shermer. Uh, to put it simply, said it would be difficult to find a supposedly scientific belief system more extraordinary than creationism, whose claims deny not only evolutionary biology, but most of cosmology, physics, paleontology, archaeology, historical geology, zoology, botany, and biogeography, not to mention much of early human history. As a, a biologist and a scientist, I want to agree with those who wholeheartedly want to teach the facts. I think we should teach the facts. We should be very careful when we cross the line into philosophy, but we want to teach the facts and we want to follow the evidence where it leads. And if the evidence leads to a creator, we should not be afraid of that. My sentence is heavily punctuated. <laughs> <laughs> Colon. Um, no. Uh, Look, I think that a lot of the dis comments are of this kind, which are to do with the philosophical arguments about the ultimate questions, and I think a lot of the ones which are on the side of uh, you know, atheism, I obviously agree with. And I think this is the critical thing to remember, because the point about uh, intelligent design and so forth is that there is no way you can observe in a scientific way that the universe is the work of an intelligent creator. When you put a cell under a microscope, you do, cannot ever say, my word, you know, he's left his signature there, or, oh, look, he's dropped his tools. It's an absurdity. And that's why, you know, you can never, from observation alone, ever conclude that there is a creator behind it. It's not science. Um, I absolutely agree with what you just said, but I thought the gentleman over there... Um, put the uh, case against intelligent design very well. It's just not intelligent and it's not very well designed. Uh, and you know, that point's been made for several years now as a counter argument to so some of the uh, spurious arguments put forward about the complexity of different organisms, etc., etc. But I still think that what we're missing is um, the, the problem in terms of education is a secular problem. It's not a, a religious problem. It's a secular problem. It's a problem of the fact that we think that uh, actually we're going to try and teach kids to be able to critically appraise arguments of this nature in the classroom uh, rather than teach them what we know about science. Uh, and I just want to make that point very, very loudly because it's being missed completely. And that is a secular argument. That comes from the atheist kind of point of view, not from the religious point of view. And unless we deal with that uh, issue, we're going to completely miss what's going on in schools. Okay, there's a gentleman who's been patient, so can we get the mic to him? And can I see if anybody else wants to speak? Just raise your hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the themes which has come up uh, once or twice is people have said uh, that when you look behind what these creationists are seeing, uh, saying, or people uh, who believe there's an intelligent designer, you often find that they are uh, Christians or something like that. And I'd say that's not entirely surprising. I've come from the opposite perspective. Up to the age of 18, I strongly believed in evolution. I went to university, and I argued with my Christian flatmates and said, look, you can't be a, a scientist and be a Christian. Science has disproved the Bible. Why believe the end of it when you know the beginning isn't true? And they argued with my science, and I ended up becoming a creationist because of that. They also ended up becoming a Christian. Now, when you look and you say creationists tend to be Christians or ID people tend to be Christians, you don't know what the root is, is there. Um, if anyone is interested in this theme, we have a book which we're giving away tonight. Five <laughs> PhD uh, atheist scientists who looked at the evidence a second time and became creationists. And there'll be many copies of those at the back. Thank you. And there was a gentleman down here. Um, yes, I, I'm not a scientist, I'm a historian. But... Um, I've been very fascinated about um, Stephen Gould, who's obviously passed away recently, but he um, uh, wrote once, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as a trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Now, he was a professor of paleontology at Harvard University, um, and he was an atheist. He goes on to say in the same article that he thinks that if that gradualism, the, the traditional Darwinism, 
is a product of Western thought, and he speaks about his view of punctuated equi equilibrium, of a different form of, of Darwinism, as being a result of, um, he speaks about the Russian paleontologists supporting that view because they had a Marxist worldview. So what he goes on to say, two things. One, as a paleontologist, he says there's not sufficient evidence in the record to warrant Darwinism. Secondly, he says that um, it's a matter of interpretation. You have a, a bias with it uh, that you bring with your philosophy, whether Marxism or some other thing. Now, he was an atheist. I would like to ask a question to Mark, because he's a zoologist, um, to what he would, uh, how he would view that as a creationist, because this is an atheist actually speaking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The gentleman there. Is there anybody else wants, who does want to speak before I... Yes, there's you there, okay. Mr. Man with the mic, start speaking. Yep. Um, I, uh, some years ago, did a, a master's degree in theology and science at a New College just down the road, um, and it was at a time when... Uh, intelligent, I certainly hadn't heard of intelligent design in the media um, in the UK uh, and uh, I looked into the, my dissertation was on the history of um, the intelligent design movement and uh, I think it's important to make a distinction between uh, creationism and intelligent design. Um, there's a debate to be had about whether or not intelligent design is science. Um, there's not a debate to be had, as far as I'm concerned, about whether or not creationism is science. Because as I think Alec has mentioned, that uh, the belief in a creator cannot be proven by scientific research. Uh, it's just not going to happen, um, because it's a metaphysical um, belief. Uh, but there are many, my, my concern is that there are many uh, books by people, by scientists, uh, you know, with PhDs from Cambridge and elsewhere and Harvard, who say, who uh, put forward a case um, for um, the presence of uh, of information in DNA and in uh, in the sort of building blocks of life. Uh, and what I hear very little of is a response to that um, that claim because the I mean uh, m someone mentioned uh, you know why why on earth should we have uh, the Christian God or, or Allah as the creator why not an alien and um, Michael Behe who's one of the sort of main proponents of intelligent design said that himself that what they're doing was not trying to prove a creator God what they thought was uh, when you look at DNA it has information and that's a scientific claim, and they believe it's based on scientific evidence. But there's very little uh, dealing with, with that claim. Instead, it's swept away as a straw man, oh, you're all creationists. Um, and I think that's problematic, and I, uh, I think that um, it's dangerous for science that, science that scientific theories are people who believe they're putting forward scientific theories, their theories have been dismissed rather than, uh, than dealt with. 